All right, so we're in Jonah chapter 4 today, and my hope today is that we have a better understanding of God and a deeper appreciation for who He is and, and what He's done for us. So, are you excited about heaven? Like, have you ever thought about what heaven will look like? Like, will there be like golden, like pearly gates and like white clouds? And what will it feel like to be in the presence of God? What will that be like? Like, I can't wait to be in heaven because the standard is God's standard when we're in heaven and nothing on earth is comparable to that. And here's another question. Are you excited to share heaven? As Christians, we get to share heaven with a holy and perfect God and we get to share heaven with all of us like all of us get to share heaven everyone who has put their faith in Jesus as their savior gets to spend heaven gets to spend eternity with God in heaven and with each other like it's so beautiful to think about that and as Christians we should be excited about heaven and being in heaven with God like that's our eternal home will be there forever and we won't be in a world filled with anger and hate and lie and sin but one common misconception about heaven is that heaven is where good people go Romans 5 8 says but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us Heaven then is not for good people. It is for sinners who have put their faith in Jesus as their Savior. And we are all sinners. Like not a single one of us has lived up to God's standard to get into heaven. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. From the smallest lie to the greatest act of destruction of violence, none of us meet God's standard and none of us are worthy of heaven so are you excited then as someone who has received grace from God to share heaven with other sinners like the people we like and the people we spend time with our family that's usually an easy like yes of course I would want to spend eternity with them but what about the people who have hurt us in unspeakable ways what about our family who hasn't always been good to us what about the guy who's cut us off on the highway or the ex-girlfriend, the ex-boyfriend who cheated on us, the thief who's been stealing from us or the boss who treats us poorly? And what about that convicted criminal that we see on TV who decided to put his faith in Christ and repented of his sins and was baptized? Like stuff like that happens. The worst of the worst that we think is the worst of the worst puts their faith in Jesus as their savior and they repent but a university professor he was speaking on the topic of criminals who have put their savior their their faith in Jesus as their savior and he said if men like that are in heaven I don't want to be there but a pastor he made a comment on comments like this he said isn't Christ's blood enough to make even the vilest offenders clean and acceptable to the Father so isn't Christ's blood enough for the worst of the worst in our world and this is the moral dilemma that Jonah is facing when we meet him in chapter 4 like how could God be so compassionate to such terrible people the Ninevites were incredibly violent and disgusting and lying people how could God be compassionate to people like that that Jonah couldn't wrap his head around sharing heaven and sharing eternity with such an awful group of people. So when we meet Jonah in chapter 4, he has just shared God's message, and the king has decreed to Nineveh, he said, don't eat, don't drink, put on sackcloth and give up your wicked ways, call urgently on God and maybe God will have compassion on us. The entire city... 120,000 people turned to God and repented and God had 
compassion on them. He gave them a second chance and he saved them. And Jonah is the most successful preacher to ever live. He said eight words to the entire city and 120,000 people turned to God. And yet Jonah is angry at, at God for having compassion on these people. In chapter 4, it shows the dialogue between God and between Jonah on God's compassion to a wicked people. So I'm just going to read the chapter. It's, it's 11 verses. And it says, But to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by going and fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a, a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, but you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. So there's two things today that we can learn about the heart of God from the fourth chapter of Jonah. First, we can learn that God is compassionate towards his creation, and second, that God cares deeply about his creation. And, and in both of these points, we can see the contrast between God and between Jonah. And when we look at who God is and who Jonah is, who we are, and we can begin to understand the depths of God's love and his heart towards his creation and his desire to share his heavenly home with us for eternity. So our first point today is that God is compassionate towards his creation. God is compassionate towards his creation because he wants to share his heavenly home with his creation with us we are god's great creation we are created in the image of god and we see this in jonah how god had compassion toward jonah towards the ninevites and even towards the sailors who were on the ship with jonah so in december of 2018 i totaled my car on the h201 it was an early 2000s white Chevy Malibu. It had no issues, 34,000 miles on it. It was a great car. It was my grandpa's car that he left to my parents when he passed away. And my parents decided to give me the car because, well, I didn't have a car and I also didn't have any money. So they gave it to me very graciously. Um, and I brought the car to Hawaii with me when I came here. And I didn't have it for more than three months, nor had I been here for more than three months before I totaled it. I was going to a Christmas party, and I wasn't familiar with the road, so I didn't realize here that a lot of the exit lanes, just like the lane just becomes an exit lane. And I was looking at my GPS, I was looking at road signs, trying to figure out where I was going. And the guy next to me in the passenger seat, he like shouted my name. And I hit the brakes, but rear-ended the car in front of me. Everyone was okay, thank God, but my car was destroyed. So on Wednesday this week, I called my mom and I was like, Mom, what was something dumb that I did that you and Dad had compassion on? And she goes, 
well, I don't know, let me, let me ask your dad. And I was like, okay, well, if dad's involved now. And this example came to him pretty quickly. And he goes, oh yeah, you totaled the car that we gave you. But this is what he said. He goes, we couldn't be mad at you because we cared more about you being okay. He said, I was upset that you totaled the car, but I couldn't be mad at you because I cared more about you being okay. My dad showed compassion on me when I was driving foolishly and not paying attention. Like he could have gotten upset. He could have yelled at me. He could have made me pay him back for, for the price of the car. But he had compassion on me because he loved me more than the 2000s white Chevy Malibu. It's similar when we look at God and we look at the Ninevites in the story of Jonah. That God's compassion towards his creation was far greater than his desire to punish the wickedness that was in the world and that the Ninevites lived out. God showed his compassion to Nineveh by giving them a chance to turn to him, giving them a second chance to turn away from their wickedness. But God gave Jonah a second chance and he gave the Ninevites a second chance. And God shows us compassion because of his desire to spend eternity with us. God wants us to be in heaven with him for eternity. And God's love, God's grace, God's mercy is far greater than the total of all of our sins. And if God's grace is an ocean, just like Jonah, we are all sinking. And when we understand God's compassion, we can find so much hope in God keeping his promise that we will be able to share heaven with him for eternity. God kept his word with the Ninevites. He gave them the second chance. And when they turned away, he kept his word and he saved them. The most well-known passage in the Bible so clearly shows God's love and God's compassion to us. It says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen. Jesus sending his son was the culmination of his love poured out for us through Jesus' death on the cross. Like Jesus is a sacrifice for our sins so that we can spend eternity in heaven with God. And that's the good news of the gospel that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so when we see the compassion that God had on the Ninevites, when God poured out his love on a wicked people, we can be confident that God's compassion is poured out to us, to every single one of us, through Jesus' death and resurrection. We can be confident that God's compassion extends to the worst of the worst and is extended to us too. And it's a good thing that God's love and compassion is not based on our decision or human reason or Jonah's way of thinking. Like Jonah hated Nineveh and nothing seemed to change that. Like Jonah had no compassion in his heart. But even after God saved Jonah from a storm and being inside of a fish for three days, Jonah still did not want to go. He still did not want to share a message of God's salvation with 120,000 people. He went, but after he went, he sat and overlooked the city and waited for God to destroy them. He wanted to see them destroyed. And I think so often this can be the case in our lives. We can be kind of hypocritical like Jonah was. Like in our relationships, we can be very quick to be forgiven, but really slow to forgive. Like we can see God's forgiveness for us, but we don't like to give that out as much as we like to receive it. Like if God has forgiven people like the Ninevites and like us, can't we be quick to forgive others too? And when we read the book of Jonah, it's easy to see that Jonah was really, really not a good prophet. The guy just didn't get it. Like, Jonah, it's a bigger picture. It's not about you. It's not about the city. It's about 
salvation and the souls of these people. But we have to look in the mirror. Like, do I have a heart for others like God has for me? Do I show compassion the way God has showed me compassion? Am I in awe of the compassion that God has poured out for me? Like this isn't about a, be- a behavior change, it's about a change in the heart in light of who God is and what He has done for us. And when we realize that God wants us to be in heaven with Him forever, that should be the <laughs> stuff that changes our heart and the behavior change will come. But it's in the heart where the change happens. And like the book of Jonah is so often just glimpsed over, right? We look at it, the prophet who was thrown off the ship by a storm, got eaten by a fish, went to Nineveh, and Nineveh was saved. But when we take a deeper look into the story of Jonah and look at it, how it applies to our life, it's so much deeper. It makes us look into the depths of our own hearts and really makes us look at the magnitude and the compassion of the love God has for us and what it means when we say that Jesus died. Like what great joy it brings to know that God's love and God's mercy completely covers every single one of our sins combined. God's mercy and grace is so much greater than the sum of all of our sins. And today we sang the song, How Great Is Our God? Do you ever think about this question? Do you ever think about the greatness of God? Like who is God and what makes Him so great? Why do people say that God is good? And they think about what it truly means for God to love the world and show compassion to people who don't follow Him. Like if God is so perfect and we are not, why would such a good God love people who are not good? But He does. And He sent Jesus. And He wants us to be in heaven with Him for eternity. Like if you ask the Ninevites, why would you say God is so good? How would they answer? Like if someone saw you today singing the song, How Great Is Our God? And they came up to you and said, why do you think God is so great? How could you answer that? What has God done in your life that is worthy of praise? And when we understand the compassion, the greatness of God, that's when our hearts begin to change. And our hearts cry out in gratefulness to an amazing God who has poured out His compassion through His Son on a cross for us and for our salvation. And our second point today is that God cares deeply about His creation. Okay, so the last year or so, Lane and I, my roommate, we've had young adults at our apartment. And we start at 7. I typically work to about 6.15, so I don't get home until about 6.30. And usually every Thursday morning and Thursday evening, Lane cleans the house so I don't have to do it because he knows I appreciate that. He cares about me. And he's been my roommate also for the last year and a half. He's been like my best friend and my listening ear and wise counsel because he cares about me. And I appreciate that so much. And uh, this last Thursday was my last day of work at the store I work at. One of my coworkers showed up at the end of the shift and she brought me pumpkin bread to celebrate my last day. And then I came home for young adults and Sierra brought me banana bread. And it's so good. Like if you ever have a chance to eat Sierra's banana bread, do it, it's really good. Um, this summer, Natasha threw a surprise birthday party for me. And in the last couple of years, like Brady has put countless amount of hours into answering my questions and discipling me and teaching me how to how to speak and how to lead and, and all these things, how to grow as a person. And when I look at all these people in my life, I feel so, so cared for and loved and, and appreciated. It's like, it's the little things, you know, the little things go such a long way, like a, a piece of banana bread or cleaning the kitchen or 
responding to a text or a phone call. The little things go a long way. But when we look at the story of Jonah, we see God using big things to reach the people he wants to reach. Like the whole story of Jonah is about God using big things. He sends a huge storm. He uses a really terrible prophet. He has a, a giant fish swallow a human being and then uses that human being to reach 120,000 people who are incredibly wicked. Like the whole story of Jonah is crazy when you really think about it. But along the way, like this is God making his wonders known. He is using these big things. He is showing his power over all of creation. If you ever watched the, the movie, The Prince of Egypt, it's God says, I will stretch out my hand and show them my wonders. And that's when like all the plagues happen. It's a really great movie. You should watch it. But through the story of Jonah, we see God's wonders. Like God did not have to do this to reach these people. He did not have to work with Jonah, the ungrateful prophet. He did not have to give the sailors a second chance or the Ninevites a second chance. He didn't have to give Jonah a second chance, but he did because he loves and cares for his creation. God used all means, all of his power to reach the people that he wanted to reach because he cares about his creation. And if God is willing to, re to use all these means to reach people like the Ninevites, Will he not use these things to reach you and to reach me and to reach all of us? And Will he not hear our prayers? If God is powerful over the oceans and his creation, will he not hear our prayers when we cry out to him? Like there are no limits to God's grace and to God's love and to the ways that he will use to bring his message to his people because he cares enough to want us to share heaven with him like God wants to share his heavenly home with us so as we read through the book of Jonah and we look at who God is we can clearly see that the characteristics of God that he is patient he is compassionate and he cares so deeply for his creation he wants us to be in community with him and when we look at Jonah through chapter 4 and through the whole book of Jonah we see that Jonah's not really he does not really possess any of these characteristics even as a prophet of God Jonah does not have the heart of God and from the beginning Jonah didn't want to take this message to these people he didn't like these people so much so that he ran away he said he would rather die than be a part of saving these people's souls God redirected his path Jonah went but he put in the most minimal effort possible God gave Jonah 40 days and Jonah gave an eight word sermon and then went and sat on a hill and overlooked them waiting for them to be destroyed he didn't teach them about God about God's faithfulness God's love, God's compassion he really didn't do much of anything he wanted to see them destroyed because he didn't care. Jonah, in fact, cared more about the plant that God sent than he did these 120,000 people living in Nineveh. In verse 9, God says, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah says, yes, and I wish I were dead. But this is God's response in verse 10. He says, you are concerned about the plant, but you've done nothing to care for it. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And the chapter ends with God asking, Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people and also some animals? The, the New Living Translation puts it this way. You feel sorry for the plant, though you did not put it there. It came quickly and died quickly, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. Not to mention the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? And God was patient 
God was caring to Jonah and the Ninevites. God used all of his creation to get Jonah to the Ninevites and get his message of redemption to them. He offered them forgiveness to people who didn't know their left from the right, people who were spiritually blind. And Jonah cared more about a plant than 120,000 people. And God says, if I should not have compassion, Jonah, on the people, what about the animals? Like, Jonah, you cared about one single plant. Should I not care about the city of Nineveh at least for the sake of the animals? And so when we look at Jonah and we look at God, we see Jonah as a man who's selfish. He has no desire to share in the grace and the love and the forgiveness that's been given to him. And then we see God who cares so much about his people and his creation that he's willing to use all of it to make his message known. And he keeps his word every single time. He provides a second chance and he freely forgives the wickedness of Nineveh. He freely forgives the wickedness of us. He freely extends the invitation to share heaven with him for eternity. He extended that to us through Jesus' death on the cross, despite us constantly living in ways that don't follow God and don't honor Him. So the chapter ends abruptly with God saying to Jonah, should I not care about the people of Nineveh? And we as readers were left kind of looking into a mirror. We're faced with the question, would I have compassion on the people of Nineveh? Would I have cared about the people of Nineveh? Do I care about people who are living spiritually blind lives? The chapter ends by challenging us to see the world through the eyes of the Creator, who is caring, who is compassionate, who wants His creation to be with Him for eternity. When we look at God in the book of Jonah, it shows us the characteristics of God and it shows us God's heart for his creation. Like we may not want to share heaven with certain people, but God's love and his grace extends to the worst of the worst because God wants to share his home with the entirety of his creation. Like This isn't about us. There is no good or bad Christian, only sinful people who need Jesus as their Savior. Amen. Only souls who need saving. God is compassionate. He cares deeply. He has extended His grace and His love to the worst of the worst of His creation. And God goes to great lengths to reach all of His people. As we look at the world through the eyes of the Creator, we can ask ourselves, do we have compassion and do we have concern for people who are living in spiritual blindness? And will we have compassion on those whose lives reflect something different than what a life lived for God should look like? Like The people whose lives you know that they don't know God. Do we have compassion on those people? And will we use our gifts and our abilities so that we can share what God has done? So we can share heaven with these people? Like not for the sake of our own good company, but for the sake of others who, who need to know that, that heaven is available to them, that God has poured out his love for them and has given them a second chance. It does understanding who God is and what he has done, does that just like put us on our knees in awe of how great God is in light of how maybe not so great we are? Like, does that change our heart to realize that God loves us so, so much? And this is the question then we are left with at the end of the book of Jonah. Do I know the heart of God? And do I reflect the heart of God towards others? Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are and what you have done for us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you just come into our hearts and change our hearts so that we are in awe of 
who God is and what He has done for us through Jesus on the cross. God, I just pray that our hearts are wide open to You and that You use all of us to make Your message of salvation known to everyone so that we can all share heaven with You for eternity. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.